Resilience, I think, is going to be the defining agenda of your lifetime, um, if not my lifetime. Um, and that is because if you'd met me 10, 15 years ago, I would have been incredibly excited in convincing you that sustainability was the defining agenda of our lifetimes. Um, I believe sustainability is vital, but it's a vision that is probably unachievable in my lifetime and maybe in your lifetimes. And res we, you know, the future is difficult, it's uncertain, and we, the, the art of the future is going to be enabling individuals, communities, city governments, companies to survive a lot of turbulence and a lot of change. Um, several people today have talked about the fact that there are X million people living in cities. But the thing that I feel is really important is where are all those new people in cities actually living? It's Africa, it's South and Southeast Asia. These are countries that lack resources and they cannot possibly build the infrastructure that is needed to support and protect their growing populations. And we can sit comfortably in somewhere like London, and Rachel can give an excellent presentation on Sheffield. They have a functional planning authority that she as an engineer can engage with. They have resources that they can tap into. They have private companies who they can engage in that dialogue. Um, in Arusha, which is a city in Africa where we're working at the moment, 80% um, of the budget of Arusha city comes from uh, national government, and 80% of the national government budget comes from donors. And the weird thing is that the donors only provide money to build the infrastructure, not to operate it and maintain it. So even if you built it, the whole thing is going to crumble. So I think we have a real problem. I think Andrew mentioned the fact that the development community have largely rural backgrounds. It's a harsh reality. Um, in some of the big, very, there are very few people within the big decision-making organizations, whether those are UN organizations or um, multilateral banks, bilateral organizations, um, NGOs, who have any concept of urbanization. Um, meantime, we train engineers to build glass and steel skyscrapers, and we don't teach them much about people. I would be very interested, some of you who are still studying, um, and it would be an interesting survey maybe for engineers without borders to do, to know how much people actually feature in the undergraduate curriculum for engineers. I managed to come out of four years at university without people ever featuring, except in my final year where I did a left field module that came from another course called Work, Society and Technology. Um, I had a meeting this morning with a colleague of mine, Sam, with somebody who believes that the future is about creating an amazing model, computer model of the whole city that will model all the interactions between economics, the infrastructure, the people, everything, formal and informal. And that this is the future, because you will then have this decision-making tool. Well, fine, you can have the information, but will people want to do anything? You know, what motivates people to act? So I think that this competition, for me, is the beginning of a viral disease or a viral awareness of resilient cities, which I hope will glo glo go global. <laughs> um, I would love to know how we can replicate what's been achieved on this competition next year in many other geographies. Uh, the Resilient Cities Conference happens each, com um, seminar happens each year, run by Italy and Bonn. And I would love for there to be a whole room just full of posters from the Resilient Cities competition. Um, there is more ideas, more clarity in what you've all produced than in tomes of peer-reviewed academic papers. Um, and, you know, your presentation was wonderful. Um, I loved your poster, <laughs> but I'm passionate about Delhi. And it epitomised the fact that, you know, we have to turn on our head what we mean by resilience. Um, I talk about brittle, brittle and ductile cities. I think London's a very brittle city. If something goes wrong, we are in big trouble. 
Um, it's a fact that the supermarkets will have their shelves empty and unable to restock them within three days if something happened that prevent traffic coming into London. And that could be just a fuel crisis. My partner has cupboards of tinned tomatoes and baked beans. <laughs> so we're going to be fine. As parents, we bring up our children to be resilient. We try and equip them to cope with the bumps and uncertainties that life is going to throw at them. You know, we as individuals, you know, when we're younger, we have got no spare money. We can't afford insurance, let alone savings. And we probably want to spend anything we've got on holidays. You know, as we get older, we have a bit of savings just in case we lose our job. You know, and, you know, we take out insurance just in case we get burgled. And my ability to survive seven burglaries in one year in London was because I had insurance. So I can do things like that to make me more resilient to shocks and stresses. The reality is that the majority of people, particularly the majority of people living in urban situations, don't have that luxury. So I want to leave you with a few thoughts that I think are really important. Um, resilience is what happens beyond survival. You can't even talk about resilience to anyone who is still in survival mode. I have worked in post-disaster situations since 1994, and you need to get people to a position where they have adequate food, nutrition, and shelter, and medical care before they can even begin to tap into their own human resources to recover. And therefore, disaster response is really, really important. And bringing up the bottom billion above the poverty line so they actually have the ability not just to survive, but to move towards thriving is, is a fundamental. The second thing that I think is really important, and this came out very strongly in the work that we did for the International Federation of the Red Cross on resilience, is that knowledge is central to resilience. You can't act and cope and transform unless you have got education and learning, understand the, the suite of risks you face, and can mobilize yourself, your friends, your family, and self-organize and act. And it is incredibly important. And, you know, I think I'm very excited about the book that we're going to pull together with all your entries because that's a knowledge product that can actually be used to disseminate this information. Um, the third thing is ecosystems. Everything we do relies on the planet, on ecosystems. And if someone said to me, what's the first thing you must do, you know, a village somewhere, is understand the value your local ecosystems, you know, are providing for you. You know, they provide water, they provide coastal defences, and as long as we continue to squander the ecosystems around us and that people don't understand the value that they bring and we don't value them, and this is particularly in an urban environment, and I think your example of the trees in Delhi is is wonderful, um, you know, we're, we're lost. And that at the moment, in every piece of research that we do and everything I read, that is the thing, the factor that is most overlooked in everything at the moment. Um, and then recognize that resilience is about scale. You've got to be resilient as an individual. You've got to be resilient within your community. And if you live in cities, the city has got to be resilient. Because the reality is, in some ways, when you live in a city, you're actually less resilient because you're dependent on the city being resilient. And infrastructure is the arteries of the city. <coughs> you know, the economy may be the veins and the people may be something else, but you know, the infrastructure is a fundamental part of it. And therefore, we as engineers have really got to get our heads around our responsibility in terms of designing that infrastructure and what it really means. And, and actually design urban infrastructure to achieve an outcome that is a resilient city. Now, I can't tell you today what that means. I can't tell you what a water system that is resilient looks like. Um, I can tell you how far we've got as Arup in trying to understand that. And it's people like Rachel and Sam and stuff putting really good heads together. Um, I'm also hugely confident that in somewhere between now and five years' time, 
that level of definition will have emerged. Because 15 years ago, we didn't really know what sustainability was. And as Ralph quite rightly pointed out, the evidence was all around us. We just hadn't packaged it. And then people came up with triple bottom line and five capitals and all these snappy models. The challenge of resilience at the moment is there are no snappy models. I'm keeping looking for them, but they, they don't really exist. There's, there's lots of models. <laughs> They're just not very snappy. They're not ones that people can grab and say, yes, we can hold that. Everything is a bit like the soap in the bath. It, it shoots off. So it is difficult, you know, and we did, there was no answer. And engineers rather like answers. <laughs> um, but everything that, went, that you put, all the effort you put into this competition and everything that's on the posters is an enormous contribution to an emerging field that, it, that is complex. Um, and I really, really encourage you to build on where you've come from um, because uh, it's, it's breathtaking and your, your thought processes are already ahead um, of a lot of <laughs> professional built environment professionals who have been working um, for 20, 25 years you know, or longer. Um, so be vocal, be change agents. There's a world that needs you. I'd like to uh, finish and encourage you to enjoy the rest of the evening. Um, I would like to challenge you to speak to at least three new people that you haven't met yet. Uh, there's a lot of bright minds in the room and we've seen from some of the presentations there's a lot of new ideas that I think uh, we, haven't, we haven't come across before or uh, offer them from a different perspective. So uh, enjoy your evening, help yourself to food and to drink and uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy meeting new people. Thank you very much.